What the f***? What in the f***? What in the f*** did the previous owner do? In the last episode of my 1986 Kawasaki GPZ-1000RX revival project, Catastrophic engine failure was prevented, everything was sealed up so fresh oil could be added, the ignition system was fully gone through, and after throwing on a battery and verifying that the starter motor works, we got compression and spark happening in every single cylinder. We are very close to getting this thing to fire up for the first time in nearly 20 years. Since that last episode, my buddy Roman came down to visit with his bus Fergie, and did a little bit of invading in the barn, but not only is that not an issue, it's a testament to just how helpful a movable workbench is, so I'm really glad I built this. I mean, if I didn't have this, I could just roll the bike out of the way, but had it been without wheels or maybe the front forks completely removed, that wouldn't have been too easy to do. So movable workbench all the way, baby. This was definitely not a waste of money and time. It was absolutely worth it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you dummy, that thing was not worth that much money. Why is there a camera in the recording booth? Why is he filming this? Why are you filming this right now? So with compression and spark taken care of, next on the chopping block is getting fuel and air sorted. So that means rebuilding the carburetors. Or at least that would be the next step if the ignition module didn't just totally shit the bed. It gave me grief in the last episode, but I fixed it by unplugging and plugging it back in. However, when I went to show Roman at firing off of starter fluid, nothing happened. It was at that point I decided to do a little more digging into things and see what was going on. I tested the resistance values of the magnetic pickup coils that tell the computer where the engine is in its rotation cycle, but they checked out perfectly fine. So if those and the coils are within spec, it has to be the ignition module that's faulty. I went in fully expecting this to be like finding a needle in a haystack, but actually it was quite the opposite. An overwhelming majority of measurements taken were way out of spec. So this thing is toast. So while I wait for the replacement one I just shelled out a decent chunk of change on to arrive, I can finally take a look at those carburetors. And there's only two things tethering the carbs to the bike and those are the throttle cables and these rubber boots. So here they are in all their glory, or in all their horror to some people. Carburetors can be very scary things for newbies. They definitely were for me before I started really getting into them. But like anything complex, it's just a lot of simple things working together. On a very, very basic level, all that's happening is this. When the piston of the engine travels downward on the intake stroke, a vacuum is created, and that suction force pulls in air from the outside world, as well as fuel from the tube that goes down to the carburetor bowl. This air and fuel mix together and head inside the engine to go boom. And that's all a carburetor is. Just an air tube that has some straws going down to a bowl of soup that'll kill you if you ingest it. These are slightly more complex than that, not to mention there's also four of them, but still, nothing you should be afraid to sink your teeth into. I tested out the slides back in part one, and they seemed pretty promising. They go down slowly instead of fast, so that means the diaphragms are working as they should. And besides some missing screws on the top covers, everything's here. One thing I did notice, though, with them now on the bench, is that the float bowls are swapped around. They should be more like this. That way, when they're on the bike, you could actually get a screwdriver onto the drain screws. But them being swapped around is a clear sign that someone's been in here before. And with all the other janky stuff that's been done to the bike, that isn't exactly leading me to believe that these are going to be all peaches and cream. To start with a teardown, a hammer-powered impact driver is implemented. This thing is pretty much needed to get these off. What look like Phillips head screws are actually JIS screws. There's an ever so slightly different shape to them, and consequently a different screwdriver needed. 
Impact driver for the win. Stripping these bolts with a Phillips head nice. screwdriver is a super common mistake made by so many people, myself included, and I'm pretty sure it's a rite of passage for working on bikes. Oh yeah, that is filthy. What the f Is that jet just completely fractured off? Yes. Yes it is. Fantastic. The rest of the bowls were equally as filthy as the first one, but the main jets are all in one piece, so only the first one had its threads sheared off the inside of the emulsifier tube. But uh, guess what? That broken jet is not the worst part. I noticed before taking the bowls off that something was wrong with the cylinder 3 pilot mixture screw, what adjusts the fuel and air ratio at idle, because it looked very mangled up. But now, I realize that it's actually stuck way too far down in there, and the point of it is actually sticking through the body of the carburetor. Not only is the screw not supposed to be fully seated, but there should be a spring inside which would limit how far it can go, removing all possibility that it could stick through the hole, so I guess that spring isn't installed. Holy crap, you would have to really, really try to mess up this badly. Did I say you shouldn't be afraid to sink your teeth into carburetors? Well, to take my mind off that atrocity, I'm gonna continue with the disassembly process and just chill out for a bit. Or maybe I'll go full caveman mode. What in the f what? See, I'm trying to knock loose the pilot jets. I unscrewed three of the four already, one of them was really stuck, so they should have just fallen out, but they're not wanting to. Finally, after what seemed like ages, I was able to get one out. I took a break from struggling with those and went on to remove some other parts I knew would be easy, just to get some wins in before I go back to banging this thing against the bench. There's another one. There we go. And there's just that freaking last one. Instead of dealing with the stuck one now, I went back to removing more easy stuff. And then, it was back to actually dealing with my problems. The solution? An extractor. Given that jets naturally have a hole going through the middle of them, I tried my luck with just hammering in the extractor as is. But after many, many attempts, no dice. I drilled out the hole a teeny tiny bit larger and tried once more. Oh, I f***ing got it! <laughs> yes! Shouldn't there be a spring in there? Yes. Yes, there should be. I actually narrated that earlier, but I guess you weren't listening. Okay, so that one was missing the spring, and that one was missing the O-ring. The pilot screw for the fourth carb came out easily as well, also missing the O-ring and washer that's supposed to be there. So now, the only subcomponent left is the completely mangled pilot mixture screw. Out came the extractor for that too, and I broke it! Oh god, fuck! I broke it off inside the screw. This is really bad. Not the handiwork of my smooth-brained self, but the more I looked at this, the more I thought the car body itself might actually be ruined. See, the threads for the screws are supposed to start just right after a little lip in the hole, but on the bad one, those threads are completely destroyed, meaning even if the screw was removed and I bought a replacement one, it literally could not be in the spot it's supposed to be in. And I'm sure I could repair the threads with a helicoil or something, but because that's so damaged and combined with the fact that it's sticking through the body of the carbon out the other side, it could just be very, very mangled up in there and, and messed with some of the passageways that aren't supposed to be messed with by having a thing stick all the way through it. Probably repairable, but not by me. So I am going to do the next best thing, and that is to buy a set of carburetors that were in an engine fire. I promise this is a good idea. These things are trash. Well, not completely, just mostly. 
I could have just purchased a set of used good carbs, but that would have run me about $300, not including shipping from Germany, because for some reason 90% of eBay parts are from there. But these were stateside and only ran me $40, which is way too good of a deal to pass on. It might not seem like a good deal because of the completely melted rubber, burnt to hell and back diaphragms and covers, plumber's epoxy repair, and overall crusty nature, but it really is going to be the saving grace. Right away I pretty much noticed that trying to operate the butterfly valves, only these two actually move. And of these two, this one is the only one that does not have a damaged diaphragm. So that means that this carburetor right here is the only one that is actually good. And on the original carburetors, this is the one that has the idle air screw just jammed right through it. So I'm just gonna put this one right there. Well, that's the plan, at least. So let's see if that plan can come into fruition. I separated the replacement carb from the rest of the set and stripped it back as far as the original ones. And actually, one step further. I had yet to remove the choke plungers from those, but I went ahead and yanked it from this guy. And I mean yanked. Good gravy. But now this, as well as every other part, is ready to be cleaned. On my ZR7S, my brother's GS500F, and on another project bike of mine that I've filmed multiple episodes on over two years ago but never released anything, I've gotten away with just hosing everything down with a carburetor cleaner, with that being all that had to be done to clear up what minimal gunk there was to get those bikes running. These are well beyond minimal gunk. Scraping with a screwdriver gets out the bulk of it, but there is still so much more. So instead of carb cleaner and countless hours with a wire bristle brush, I'm gonna use this, an ultrasonic cleaner. I have heard nothing but good things about these, even about the cheap small Harbor Freight one that I got. This is not something that's absolutely necessary, but it helps out immensely and it's an investment for the future, to be used again and again. But one really important thing I want to mention is the cleaning concentrate that I'm using. It is Simple Green Pro HD. I spent countless hours researching what to get because there are a lot of cleaning agents out there that can damage and discolor aluminum. Ask me how I know. But this stuff is non-corrosive and safe on metals. For my guinea pigs, I decided to use two of the float bowls so we can see a direct comparison with their counterparts. And it's as simple as just tossing the parts in closing it up and turning it on. But almost immediately, I took the lid back off because I wanted to see the magic happen. I know it's not crystal clear, but you can see the grime dusting away as if Thanos just snapped his fingers. So after letting those sit for a good while and then flipping them around after a bit longer, they're ready to come out. Now, like I said, this cleaning stuff isn't corrosive, but you still don't want it hanging around on these parts. So I also gave them a little tiny water bath and a light scrubbing with a plastic bristle brush. Clearly they're not done being cleaned yet, but holy crap, what a difference already. The outside brightened up immensely, and same with the inside. Not bad. And you can see just how murky the cleaning agent is too now, but that means it's working. So I threw them back in, added a bit more concentrated water to raise the level up to cover the whole part, and let it go one more round. I realized that I still hadn't removed the drain screws for these, and guess what? There is an o-ring missing. I don't think anything bad on this bike can surprise me anymore. But holy wow, look at these. Talk about night and day. Bill Cosby versus Bill Cosby's comedy. Yeah, this ultrasonic cleaner was definitely worth every penny. I can essentially just throw something in there, walk away, and come back to something cleaner than a surgeon's scalpel. Not too shabby. To keep riding this cleaning high, I started tackling the rest of the parts. I'm talking needles, slides, jets, everything, until all that was left are the actual carb bodies. I tackled the replacement one first, and after a few long cycles, it looked like this. Okay, let's be honest, this isn't really great looking, but compared to one that isn't clean, it actually doesn't look too bad. There is still some discoloration on the barrel here, but it is still as smooth as onion skin, so it's good. The green paint on one side of the butterfly valve came off, 
but that doesn't matter at all. The only thing that does really bother me is the level of oxidation happening on the inside of the body. I tried getting that off with lots of scrubbing and many more cycles in the cleaner, but nothing was working. Finally, I gave in and used my blasting cabinet, and that cleaned it up immediately, but it left a very rough matte finish, which is exactly why I didn't just blast everything in the first place. I mean, it's still gonna work fine, but it's just not the prettiest. Kinda like you, Darren. There is some pitting, which isn't a problem at all for the inside of the carb, but it might be a problem on the mating surface for the float bowl. So what I did off camera was fill those in with some JB weld. Now I know I have not had a great track record with JB weld and gasoline environments, but this repair is closer to the one I did on the cover panel for the coolant passage on the Fiero's engine and not the gas tank. It's not filling a hole to the outside world, but instead just filling in little divots to ensure a good seal. So I am 100% confident in this. So with that repair done, and also this thing spotless, it should be more than adequate enough to replace the bad one on my original set. Whoa, double carburation? No. And on that original set, the insides don't look anywhere near as bad as the fire damaged one, so these should clean up beautifully. After breaking them down to their individual bodies, they're ready to hop in the bath. Well, except for this guy. Let me just say, I don't think I'm ever gonna get tired of seeing the results of this. That is fantastic. I mean, really fantastic. These are a far cry from what they used to be. But if we're being 100% honest with ourselves here, that fire damaged one with the matte finish on the inside sticks out like a sore thumb. There is a process called vapor blasting that basically replicates the factory finish where instead of blasting sand, like I did with this guy, you blast a slurry that's made up of teeny tiny glass particles and water. But I don't have the equipment for that. It's not necessary, it just makes it look a little bit nicer. If you do want to see what the process of vapor blasting entails and the results of it, there's a super great channel called Classic Octane. Taylor over there has a huge catalog of videos documenting the restoration, repair, and modification of so many motorcycles. I definitely recommend checking it out. Now in a lot of cases, vapor blasting can be a complete substitute for ultrasonic cleaning, but that wouldn't have worked in my case, because the air jet passageways on all three of my original ones were completely clogged. It took probably five more cycles after I initially thought they were spotless, and so many blowouts with compressed air until I finally got it so light can shine through. But with that, we're finally ready to put everything back together. The first things to go back in are the choke plungers, because there's no room to install these guys once the carbs are bolted back together. Next are the fuel fittings, both the inlets and the overflows. Then it's just a matter of squeezing everything together. Just make sure to install the spring that goes between the butterfly valves though. And also maybe adjust the valves so they line up. After doing the same for both sides, the brackets can be added to make these four carbs into one solid unit. And after that, I installed the choke slide rail. Oh. And next, I added in the springs and screws for syncing up the valve so they open and close at the same time. That'll absolutely be fine-tuned later when they're actually on the bike and running, but right now, eyeballing it is good enough. Next up are the jets and emulsifier tubes. And this last one is from the fire damage set because the original one had the main jet snapped off inside and because one of the pilot jets was also damaged for some reason, I snagged a good one of those from the fire damage set as well. And for installing these, I was taught that it's best practice to add a teeny tiny dab of Marvel Mystery Oil or another lightweight oil onto the threads for these, so I did just that. And now with these on, the main jets have got to go because I'm replacing all of them with brand new ones. Now you may be asking, couldn't you just take one of the good main jets from the fire damage set and use that just like you did with the pilot jet? Well, no, because they're not actually the same. See, the purpose of jets is to limit how much fuel gets sucked up into the tube to go into the engine. The smaller the jet, 
the smaller the amount of fuel and vice versa. And there's supposed to be a specific ratio of fuel and air. If you do something like install a more freely flowing exhaust or add in pod filters, which this bike probably had because there's a battery tender blocking right where the factory airbox is supposed to mount up to, there's going to be greater airflow into the engine. If you up the airflow, you gotta up the jet size to maintain that same fuel air ratio. The fire damaged carbs were at a stock size of 132 for the main jet, while my bike was at a larger 140. With how shitty these carbs were, I honestly didn't expect that to have been done. But after googling around, I found an online guide, which isn't dogma by any means. But following that formula, it said I should probably be running a size 138 main jet. So that's what I purchased. Now, airing on the side of too rich is definitely better than too lean, so I totally would have used the size 141s already on here if one of them wasn't totally broken. I was also able to salvage enough parts from both carbs to get everything I needed for the pilot air mixture screws. Now I didn't swap out the pilot jet with a bigger one, like the main jet, because one, you really don't have to since the increase of airflow from the pod filters is practically nil at idle when the throttle blades are closed, and two, so I can set the mixture screw exactly as the manual says at one and three quarter turns out, instead of dealing with the whole process of fine tuning that setting. Lazy? No, I'm just time conscious. But that is it for the brass. Next is installing the floats with some brand new float valves. And much like everything with carburetors, they're supposed to be fine tuned. So these were adjusted as per the service manual's instructions. For the float bowls themselves, I got brand new gaskets and brand new hardware. But once these were fully tightened down, I installed the drain plugs with actual o-rings this time and that wraps up the lower half of the carbs for the top half i want to make sure the needles are adjusted correctly because they're actually aftermarket when you're installing larger than factory main jets it's common practice to raise this needle up either by throwing some washers under the factory one or by getting this aftermarket style that i guess the original owner installed and with it in this setting, the tip is just a little bit higher up than the stock one when you line up the bases, so that means it's already in the spot I want it to be in. The job of the needle is to plug up the main jet so it's not used when the bike's at idle, but when the engine increases speed, the needle raises up, unplugging the jet. So by adjusting the clip so it's sitting up higher, you're basically giving it a head start so fuel can start flowing sooner. Pretty neat stuff. But with that top end taken care of, all that's left to put on these are the choke cable bracket and the idle adjustment knob. It's done! Oh, no it's not. It's vacuum parts. Oh right, those need to be capped off too. But okay guys, the carbs are finally done and I think they look pretty damn good. Now I would say that they're ready to go back on the bike, but I want to take care of the spark issue before I do that. And that's actually perfect timing because the replacement computer just came in. Yes, it is a used computer. It has 20,000 miles on it, but that's only a fraction of the 60,000 miles that my bike had. The only thing wrong with it that I can see is some slight oxidation on the terminals, but after giving it a scrapey scrape and a spray down with some electrical contact cleaner, it's good to be tested with the multimeter or to be tested by plugging it in and seeing what happens. Oh yeah. Did you see that? We got spark. All right. Now all that's left is to get these carbs on the bike and see if it'll run. And that's going to be in the next episode. So tune in next time to I'm just fucking kidding. Let's fire this bike up. Probably should have gotten some new gas. But, uh, that'll have to do. Okay. Well, that was wild. Wild indeed.
not just in the positive sense because I've never owned a bike that has fired up this quickly before, but in the negative sense because there's actually a teeny tiny fuel leak. Great. Okay, so that right there is probably the problem. The little tube that connects carburetor one and two is completely soaked, so <laughs> it probably wasn't smart of me to reuse those O-rings. Yeah, no. Definitely not smart of you. What also wouldn't be smart of you is running the engine a little bit longer without doing anything about the leak. But honestly, I'm too excited about this thing actually running to not fire it up again. Unfortunately, the joy didn't last long because it started just puking coolant. I shut off the valve for the fuel supply and ran the bike until it died just to drain out the remaining fuel from the line. But dang it, that is not fun. Truthfully, I only planned on running the bike for a minute or two tops because I assumed there wasn't any coolant at all. Now I know there is, but only because something failed. Yeah, this will definitely have to be sorted out, along with a bunch of other things preventing this engine from running well and reliably. No time like the present. Let's get to work. Wait, hold on. My boss just told me that's apparently for the next episode? Well, if that's the case, until next time, I'll see you guys later.